Okay, um, I think we'll get started. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us on today's lecture um, on training a deep learning model. Uh, we're super excited to share insights with you. Um, I'm Sarah, Sarah Massessa, Brand Marketing Manager at Hyperscience, uh, based out of our New York City office. And um, throughout Chris and Christo's uh, presentation, feel free to drop your questions uh, in the chat and uh, they'll answer them at the end of the session. Um, for those of you who have uh, missed last month's session, I just wanna give some quick background on uh, the purpose of Hyperscience Learn. Um, and so this lecture was inspired by our team's desire to spread our enthusiasm, knowledge, um, expertise about machine learning amongst larger machine learning communities. Um, and these are free monthly webinars that will eventually be moved um, on site once COVID, uh, you know, dies down. Um, and then future webinars uh, will be driven by the community, uh, which is you all. Um, so at the end of this session, we'd love if you could take the time uh, to fill out a feedback survey um, that will be circulated and just write down any ideas for future topics or future um, future questions that you'd like to be uh, presented in future lectures. Um, during last month's session, uh, Machine Learning 101, the past, present, and future of ML, our director of ML, Evo, uh, said the foundation for mastering ML principles, techniques, and applications. Um, if you missed that session, uh, you can watch the recording on the Hyperscience Learn website, um, which can be found at hyperscienceLearn.com forward slash HSLearn. Uh, and this current session will also be recorded and posted to the website if you miss any of it. Um, okay, so with that said, I'm going to pass it over to my colleagues, Christo and Chris, so they can get started. Great. Hey everyone, um, I'm Chris. Um, a bit a bit background for me. I've been studying in the University of Sofia uh, with computer science and artificial intelligence. And for the past four and a half years, I've been working in hyperscience uh, as an ML engineer. Most recently, I've been leading one of the ML teams here that's responsible for extracting tables from documents. Um, in my free time, I'm an avid board games geek. Um, I have so many board games at home that at this point I don't even have free shelf space for them. Uh, so I should probably do something about this. And thank you for joining and I hope you like this lecture. Hello from me too, I'm Christo and um, I uh, studied in the Technical University of Sofia um, and I studied automation engineering then I'm in the company um, around 10 months now. So, and I'm in the data generation team. Um, I actually like to travel. I'm from the sea and I also like the sea and the, um, and also the nature. And um, I think we should start the lecture with uh, the types of machine learning algorithms. First, uh, let's see what types of machine learning algorithms they are and what problems we can solve with them. The three most used types of machine learning algorithms are supervised, unsupervised, and reinforcement learning. Um, the main difference these three algorithms have is the type of data we train them with. Supervised learning algorithms need data with predefined outputs, as known as uh, ground truths, to learn. Um, these ground truths might be labels or output values. And um, then with this data, the supervised learning algorithm makes a function that maps the input to the, to the output. This function is known as the machine learning model, actually. Um, for example, if we have images of strawberries and blueberries, and they are labeled, uh, which is called the ground truth, at, as I said, the model will learn to map each image with its label. And when we give it a new image of strawberry or uh, 
blueberry, it will hopefully guess the answer. And um, but clean and perfectly labeled data sets aren't easy to come by because they're hard to make. They have to be annotated by humans most often. Um, and sometimes engineers um, are asking the algorithm questions that they not, don't know the answer to. That's um, where unsupervised learning comes in. In unsupervised learning, the model is uh, handed a data set without explicit instructions or what to do with it. Um, and the training data set is a collection of examples without a specific um, outcome or a correct answer. The algorithm then attempts to, automatic, to automatically find um, structure or some features in these data and uh, analyze it, then cluster it. Um, the two most common unsupervised learning problems are clustering and animal detection, which are used nowadays. In our case, um, we have um, strawberries and uh, blueberries and bananas, uh, which don't have labels to them. Um, and the machine learning algorithms tries to uh, find the similar features of each of the categories and uh, tries to group them in a uh, number of categories we give it. For example, in this case, we will give it three um, groups and it will just split them. Um, and Another example would be some banks detect fraudulent transactions using animal detection, uh, which is also an unsupervised learning uh, approach uh, by looking for unusual patterns in customer purchasing the behavior. And another popular machine learning algorithm is reinforcement learning. Uh, here we have some environment and an agent Oversimplified, the agent um, takes a state that uh, from that environment and based on it makes some action that will either give the agent a reward or it will punish it in some way. Based on that experience, it learns by itself what is good to do and what is bad to do. Um, these algorithms are particularly useful in games um, because uh, it is in their nature. In the games, we have environments and tangents. And uh, often they end up with some creative solutions um, because there are no human data involved in the loop and they can't be biased in some way. A well-known reinforcement learning uh, model is AlphaGo, which defeated one of the best Go players in five years ago. This model was actually first trained with human data and then perfected by playing with itself. But later, DeepMind, which is uh, the creator of AlphaGo, uh, created AlphaZero, which uh, defeated even AlphaGo and was trained all by itself. And actually, Alpha Zero not only be the best machine learning model in Go, but also in chess and uh, shogi. There is an even there is an, even a movie about Alpha Go, and I recommend watching it if you haven't. Um, nowadays, supervised learning algorithms are the most used in the machine learning field, and uh, also, most we, we have processed uh, use supervised learning most often. That's why we will focus on supervised learning in this and the following lecture. And uh, three machine learning algorithms walked into a bar.
The two major problems supervised logarithmic algorithms so far regression and classification. We have a regression problem when we have some input data and we want to predict a continuous value. Let's say we want to predict the size of a strawberry based on its image. The size is a continuous value, so we deal with a regression problem here. Another common example uh, would be if we, if we want to predict the, the price of the house um, based on its uh, living area. The machine learning algorithm will try to make some function uh, that maps the area and the price, and hopefully it will give us relevant um, answer when we ask it to predict a price um, of a new house. And the classification problem uh, would be such that we want to predict the label um, or give an example. Um, we want to predict a label um, based on um, the example, the input we give it. Um, examples of classification problems would be given an email uh, classified as um, spam or not spam or given an image to classify it as a dog or cat or human, uh, whatever categories we have. Um, and compared to the previous example, here we have strawberries, but this time we want to classify them to classify them as small, medium, and large instead of um, getting their exact size. And in this lecture, we're going to do a classification task. Um, we will have a data set of 100 digits, which is called MNIST. Some of you may have heard of it. And uh, that we have to classify these digits. Um, there are a lot of, classification of classical machine learning algorithms uh, that can solve these problems. Uh, for example, there is linear regression, logistic regression, um, support vector machines or decision trees and many more. Um, but for now, we're going to focus on solving these problems with neural networks. Um, so let's see what these neural networks are made of. Um, this is called a Persetron, and it is the smallest part of the artificial um, neural network. And uh, it is similar to uh, the neurons in the brain. Um, to sum up uh, the content from the previous lecture, uh, biological neurons have two main properties. Um, they are connected to and receive electrical signals from other neurons, neurons and uh, they can be activated in some way um, before they process the input. Um, and this is our artificial perceptron. Um, which uh, he will show you in the previous lecture. And the processing, we have inputs and we have weights and uh, a bias, which is actually a weight, but multiplied by one. Uh, and the processing unit just sums up the weights multiplied by their inputs and adds the bias to it. This is uh, how it's happening here. And we may have also uh, many of these perceptrons connected together. Uh, and this is actually called a multilayer perceptron, perceptron or simply a neural network. Um, but there is some serious problem with this neural network. If we try to train it, we'll see that if we use only perceptron, only one perceptron, it will have the same performance as the whole network. Um, but why is that? Because of the mathematical concepts involved in 
our current forward pass function, which is uh, the function that I showed you earlier. And we can't break the linearity of the model. And thus, um, we can't make uh, some complex uh, functions. That's why we need some sort of a function to break this linearity. Here comes the activation function. The activation function decides whether to activate the neuron or not, or most commonly, how much to activate the neuron. As I said, uh, its purpose is to introduce nonlinearity into the output of the neuron. Um, and this is one of the most used um, activation functions, the rectified linear activation function, or rel in short. Um, it is a piecewise linear function um, that will uh, output the input directly if it is positive, and otherwise it will output zero, as you can see. Um, it has became the default activation function for many types of neural networks because a model that uses it is easier to train and often achieves better performance than the other. Um, now let's see, uh, let's visualize the concepts I just explained. Um, this is TensorFlow Playground, and um, it's basically a playground where you can test some uh, neural networks, small neural networks that you can play around with them, and uh, you can explore the space uh, in some basic examples. Here, for example, here for example, we have a classification problem. Um, we have a lot of data points. We have blue and orange data points. And the task is that we have to classify them. Um, we're given the two coordinates of each of the points. And we have two hidden layers. Uh, it's very important that we have an input layer, uh, several hidden layers, or we can also don't have hidden layer in the person version. And we have an output. Now, uh, in this in this setup, uh, we don't have an activation function. We just have a linear activation function, which is the same as not having it. And let's see what happens here. We can see that uh, we don't. Uh, we don't want this to happen. You can see that um, the black ground here is blue and in the upper left corner is uh, orange, which does not represent the classification we want. Uh, we expect to have blue, blue background in the, in the center of this circle and uh, orange background in the peripheral. Uh, this would be our function that would classify the points. And um, now we can, we have, to, we will change the activation function to rel and we will have an activation function. And you can see how fast uh, the model learned that um, each blue data point uh, corresponds to this area and the other data points correspond to the other area. You can also see that we broke linearity. Um, we, in the first hidden layer, you can see that we have linear functions printed. And in the second hidden layer, um, we have more complex functions. And um, in the end, we can build a neural network uh, that can, for example, classify cats and dogs. 
um, the animation you see represents for propagation, which is all of this I have been explaining so far. In and in this network, uh, you can see that we have an input layer, a couple of hidden layers, and an output layer. But how do we determine? How do we choose the number of hidden layers, and why do we need more of them? Um, basically, the more layers we have, more complex and, com and more complex functions we can make with them, and the model beca becomes more complex. Uh, let's see an example of that also. Here we have um, the same setup, but we have different data, a more complex data set, which consists of um, its function is um, more complex than the previous one. And you can see that with one header layer and an activation function, ReLU, we can uh, 